Welcome to episode 4 of Radio Artis, a podcast by Studium Generale Artis. So, we're back after a short winter break. We needed some time to work on the story we have for you today, which is all about climate breakdown, but maybe not in the way you would expect it. It's about how climate breakdown affects us, how it makes us feel, and how we might have to change the way in which we talk about it. It features excerpts from a talk by Harriet Bergman, combined with parts of a conversation we had with Harriet before the talk. Harriet was invited as part of the How on Earth program by Studium Generale. And here to introduce this episode with me is one of the organizers of that program, Rana Gavami. So, welcome back, Rana. Thank I've you. I've convinced you to uh, come in front of the microphone again. Yes. <laughs> is it any less intimidating now? No, not oh. at all. <laughs> okay. All right, but um, I didn't drag you in front of a microphone just to taunt you. We're here to talk about something. Um, last time you mentioned the program How on Earth. Yes. Um, and we now are actually able to present a podcast in that series. So yes. um, can you tell me a bit about How on Earth? Yes. So uh, How on Earth is a film program. And it took place at Aki Enschede last year on a monthly basis. And it was developed in tandem with the course Living Images, uh, which is um, actually developed by my colleague, uh, Agnieszka Wolotsko. So we came together in the auditorium once a month uh, with a student who had um, signed to this course. And yeah, we discussed how visual perception affects uh, the ways in which we inhabit this world and the stories we tend to tell and trust. And that's also kind of uh, connected to the bigger story at hand today, right? You mean the story of the Anthropocene? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the story of the Anthropocene, depending upon how we use that uh, uh, concept and terminology, uh, it can at, at times be used as a way to you know, address this idea that man as a primary agent uh, has a destructive and a long-lasting effect upon planetary systems. Uh, but an often recurring issue in this discussion is how the term is deceiving as it suggests that we are all responsible for it. Whereas there's a difference between the various agents involved. So uh, for instance, let's say between the fossil fuel companies, uh, government and well, people like you and I. Yeah. Yeah. And so therefore, if we, if we don't critically examine the, the way we use certain terminologies, we not as in just use it, but also to use it to think about the world and the ways in which we inhabit and how we come together and how we want to transform it, then we end up perpetuating the same power dynamics and we fail to yeah, give an account of what is happening to the soil, to the built environment, to um, toxic exposures, um, systematic violence towards like yeah, black, brown, poor and indigenous people. And, uh, and those who are responsible for it. Yeah, I was at one of those evenings, one of those screenings. Um, I watched the slightly disturbing movie Bridge Over Troubled Water by the performance collective MSL and Jaco Palasfuo. And that movie was introduced by Harriet Bergman. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, Harriet Bergman is a researcher and an activist. And uh, she talked about how we are emotionally affected by climate breakdown and in turn um, how we cope with it and what we can do about it. In her talk, she also made a distinction between ethics and politics and why it is a necessary distinction to make and what that does. So welcome, Harriet. I'm very excited Thank about you. this conversation and having you here. Um, can you please introduce yourself shortly to our... Yeah, audience. so I'm uh, Harriet Bergman. I'm uh, an activist and an academic. And both my activist work and my academic work uh, focus on climate justice. Uh, so I do research at the University of Antwerp. I do a philosophy PhD on discomfortable emotions and climate change. 
Uh, and what I study there is I look at social movements and how they mobilize and what they do. I mm -hmm. look at uh, affect studies and I look at climate breakdown. Right. <laughs> so it's uh, quite a confronting uh, topic. Yeah. And in my, well, if I'm not working, I sort of do the same. <laughs> So I do media work for Code Road and mm -hmm. for Fossil Free Culture, which mm -hmm. are both uh, climate justice groups in different ways. So the first one, Code Road, is a massive civil disobedience <laughs> platform. So we do very large actions with uh, a lot of people to directly confront the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. And Fossil Free Culture is uh, almost the opposite on the climate justice activism spectrum. Mm -hmm. We do uh, artistic performances to sort of show uh, the, the entanglement between the cultural industry and the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. And we uh, ask public cultural institutions to drop the sponsorship of fossil fuel companies. So, oh. I, I mean, I do a lot more, but those are the two. <laughs> <Those are laughs> I also of. sleep and... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and have friends. I have friends. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I'm not only doing that, but those are there. <laughs> right. Well, I wanted to ask you, or actually start as by asking you how you um, how you are affected by the overwhelming presence of climate change. Um, I think you <laughs> said already quite a lot about it. Yeah. So if you are so busy with the subject, or so occupied by the subject, so I. Mm -hmm decided to work on it, which is 40 hours a week extra of <laughs> climate change, which is uh, quite difficult, you, you find ways to cope with it. Mm -hmm. So I try to sometimes not think about it, but that's also only possible because I do engage with it in like an active way. Mm -hmm. So I feel that in some sense there is a, that, that my behavior is, is consonant with what I'm what I know to be true about the state of the world. And that makes it a tiny bit easier. Right. But then, yeah, then again, it's of course, uh, uh, yeah, pretty horrible. So if you, something I asked myself was, what do these uh, alarming reports of deforestation, fires, or immoral responses of politicians such as Baudet or Rutte do to us? Um, because, you know, a lot of people feel the urgency and the necessity to act. And groups like Extension Rebellion want governments to declare a climate emergency, or others talk about it in terms of crisis. And interestingly, uh, what Harriet does, she asks, okay, but what does it do uh, to us and to, you know, how do we deal with this when we talk about it in terms of a crisis? Um, what, do, what emotions does it evoke and to what effect? So, so why this uh, focus on emotions? Well, for instance, fear is a powerful emotion that, uh, and it can be used to stir up hateful ideas and resentments. So if we talk about it constantly in terms of crisis, that can also evoke a lot of fear. And if you think about it, this has become quite a common practice for politicians or, or you know, others who benefit from this situation to talk about it in these terms and therefore also not only steer up, uh, I think, hateful ideas, but also draft new politics, which, which can have a very deadly effect. So in a way, you, what, you, what we can say is the way we communicate about cl climate breakdown also perpetuate certain feelings, ranging from yeah, anxiety, guilt, but also, of course, optimism or denial. So, uh, in a way, it's, um, it's really important which words we choose. So, first, climate breakdown is real. Um, well, that doesn't need that much of an introduction. Uh, most of you probably already know about the IPCC, about fires everywhere, about things not going really right. But what I want to add to that is that not only is climate change happening, uh, we should also talk about it in a different way than we're used to. And what I mean with that is that, for one, uh, we shouldn't call it uh, 
either or issue. So it's not like either climate change will happen or we will prevent it. It's actually an ongoing process and we can try to make it a tiny bit less worse. Or we can try to prevent the very real horrible things that will happen. We can try to try to make it a tiny bit worse. Because of course, uh, if we go over our tipping points of two degrees, that's really bad. But if you go over, your, over the tipping point of four degrees, it's even much worse. Another point I want to talk about is that I put climate breakdown there rather than climate change. Because yeah, change doesn't sound inherently bad, right? Most people like change. Uh, you change when you grow up, you change when you move to another place, change is good, blah, blah, blah. But I think climate change is a too neutral term for what is going on, especially if you imagine uh, Sydney in Australia, which is now affected by the bushfires or California. That's not just change, that's something that's really bad. And with really bad is an understatement. Then I also don't talk about climate crises, which is a bit less common of a thing to hear. But I don't like to talk about crises because I feel that in terms of crises, if we think of the, the banking crisis or how Greece was a country in crisis or, well, a relationship crisis, <laughs> all these crises ask for a sort of strong intervention. They ask you to act now. They ask for strong leaders, for harsh measures. They ask sort of that to, to save the thing is more important than the ways with which you save it. And I'm not sure if this is a common feeling, but for me, this crisis thing sort of has this harsh, uh, yeah, harsh sound to it. And yes, I think climate breakdown requires fast and harsh measures. But I refuse to use this crisis narrative, although I will accidentally use it also throughout this introduction probably because it's so common. But I, I try to be aware of the words I use because I think they really impact uh, how you think of something. Okay, Rana, so now we have uh, that out of the way, the terminology is clear. What are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about, or we talked about also how we can cope with the feelings that come along with the uh, climate breakdown and why it is necessary to make a distinction between the various agents involved. And for this, like Harriet uh, talked about and asked critically, well, who is this we when we are talking about what does it do to us? You know, who is this us? And the first important question, actually, always when people speak about we, is who is this we you're talking about? Is this we like this room? Is this we the Western world? Is this we people who know about climate change? Who is this we exactly? And in a lot of the discourse around climate breakdown, we sort of forget who we are talking about. So this is not only in when we talk about how we feel, but it's also in terms like the Anthropocene, or terms like we should do something, or humankind has to act. Like who is the humankind that has to act? Like are you specifically not doing enough right now? Or like what is it? Where is the responsibility? Who is doing what? Yeah, so in a way what Harriet is saying, we all deal with climate change, with climate breakdown, but uh, not in equal measures. Yes, indeed, we are all affected by it, but uh, the ways in which we are affected by it is differentiated depending upon our positionality. So where we live, uh, who we are, the bodies we inhabit, and therefore how we respond to it as well. You know, the conversation is about the climate breakdown is real and it's an ongoing process, which means that it's quite hard to grasp if you say it's real and it's an ongoing process. What does that entail? which makes it also very hard to accept. Yeah, and because you, it's hard to accept what you can't grasp. Yes. And one of the things is passive acceptance. So it's sort of knowing what's going on and deciding not to act. Because of course we know that fossil fuels have a certain effect and that Shell might not be the best company ever. Like these are all things we sort of know, but there are more things in which we passively accept uh, that are even yeah, more indirect. And that, that actually makes a lot of sense. So one of the researchers I'm uh, researching, <laughs> so much 
research and research and research. One of the researchers I'm researching is called Stanley Cohen, and he talks about different forms of denial. Um, and he says there is literal denial. Well, we probably all know some examples of people speaking in the media or friends or, you know, the, the racist uncle who's also a climate denier. We all have those kinds of people somewhere or we know about them who say nothing is happening. This is not real. Uh, you have hot summer sometimes, you have cold, cold winter sometimes, whatever. Sure, that's one sort of denial, literally denying what's going on. Then you also have interpretative denial. So that is, okay, we have these scientific facts, they tell us something, but how do we interpret them? Well, okay, sounds legit, you know, to, it's always good to question facts because there were a lot of things, scientific facts that we now have, well, different opinions about, like phrenology was a fact and, you know, that women were inferior was a fact. So I get this sort of interpretation issue, but what they say is maybe climate change is not man-made or human-made, man-made, human-made, doesn't really matter, mostly, mostly man, <laughs> but maybe climate change is not man-made, or maybe that it's getting hotter uh, doesn't have to be so bad because now we don't have to fly to Ibiza anymore and we can just enjoy the sun here in the Netherlands, woohoo! So that's interpretative denial. Looking at the facts, accepting them, but saying maybe it doesn't mean what these climate-crazy people say uh, it means. And then the last form of denial is, I think, a form that I also suffer from or benefit from, and it's implicatory denial. So it's not per se denying the facts, it's not denying the interpretation, but it's denying that I should do something about it. It's denying that I also have it in my power to do something about it. So it's, for example, knowing that climate breakdown is real, but deciding that you want to go to Thailand anyway on vacation. Or seeing the picture of the Kiribati people and then thinking, oh, but I just really like meat. So it's accepting the facts, but not accepting that that means something about your personal life. So, so if we know it, then yet we, is it about not being able to accept it? Is it about... It's about, it's about, I think it's both about not being able to accept it because it's Primo Levi once said something that what's morally uh, unthinkable is also like, yeah, like when you think something is morally not possible, you, you don't accept that it's happening. Uh, well, he probably phrased it much better, but that's sort of the idea. And yeah. I, it's the same here, like it's morally unthinkable, like it's it's unacceptable and therefore very difficult to, to think right. that it's happening or to accept that it's happening when you, you just can't add it up. But it's also in the behavioral changes we make, we also deny what is happening. So for example, I flew to Portugal this year because I had no other option uh, between uh, quotation marks. So I make a lot of adjustments. I go to the train almost everywhere if, if it's possible. But of course, do I have to go to Portugal or do I have to buy things wrapped in plastic or am I just too lazy to get it somewhere else? And that's a form of denial that's very difficult mm -hmm. also because you don't want to or it, it feels like a moral obligation is something you should be able to do, but also that shouldn't be too much. So... Um, for, for one thing, what I think is uh, a good distinction to make is between whether you act because you want to be a kind of person, so because you see it as, as a moral obligation or because you see it as a part of your ethics, and if it's concerned in like a field of ethics, or whether you do it because you want societal change, so it's part of a field of politics. And for me, especially in climate change, this is a, uh, a very n uh, relevant distinction because a lot of people behave, what I would say, say like semi-ethical or very ethical. So they uh, go to the Eco Plaza and they don't fly and they recycle and they have their own garden. Mm -hmm. So they behave very ethically. 
yeah, they they're living some sort of good life or their their principles are consonant with their behavior. But then on a political level, they do not make an impact. So what is a good society is not addressed in their what is a good life or how should I behave. And for me, I don't want to prescribe people how to live a good life or what what should be an ethically or morally, morally good life for them. So I'm like, okay, do whatever you feel is good for you. And if you decide to eat meat, yeah, it doesn't impact me that much. You know, it's not that bad. But what does impact me a lot is how you behave in a political way, who you vote for, whether you be believe voting is enough, uh, how you sort of uh, impact this, this power field. It's not only about denial and acceptance. There are actually bigger feelings at stake. So first, when I talked about the climate feels or all the feelings that come along with climate breakdown and accepting that it's really bad was denial or passive acceptance. So walking by, driving by, cycling by a shell tank station, continuing your life as usual as if nothing is going on. It's a way to cope with the dramatic feelings that climate change can cause. Because if you don't recognize something as true, or if you just accept it without acting, then you can go on with your life, which is much more fun than having to cry in bed the whole time. So another thing, another very common reaction uh, to climate, uh, climate breakdown, and one that is happening more and more, is the experience of loss. And this is especially among scientists, so people who work with the subject a lot, and among activists, uh, so people who act about it a lot, uh, very common. And sadly, I'm at the intersection of both. So I have a lot of loss to deal with, and I'm very often confronted by it. And what does uh, this loss mean, or what do, they, what do these scientists talk about when they talk about loss? One is the mourning of a future. So you sort of always had this idea, or I always had this idea, like, oh, I'm gonna become very old, I'm gonna live in Amsterdam for my whole life, it's gonna be so much fun, I'm gonna buy a house or I rent a house, I wanna live in an attic filled with books and a crazy cat. That sort of was my plan. And mind you, this doesn't even involve children, but this was my plan, this was my future. And now I'm sort of confronted with the possibility that what I thought would be my future very likely will not be what my future looks like. My future will consist of food shortage, probably, maybe. My future will consist of a lot of the people I care about deciding not to get children. My future will consist maybe not of Amsterdam, which is a place I like so much. So there's this mourning of the future, this thinking about the future that you've lost, which is, of course, an experience of loss. Another way you encounter loss when you write and feel climate breakdown is the loss of identity. And this maybe sounds a bit weird, but large parts of our identity are built on fossil fuels. So all the plastic you consume, the places you go to, all these things, yeah, they, they require a system that enables climate breakdown. So the loss of identity or grappling with the idea that who you are is complicit and intertwined and built on this thing that's actually bad for your own future and for the planet, well, that's a very sad experience. That's loss that you have to mourn. Another one of the losses uh, the scientists write about is the loss of all the privileges you have and all the good things you do. So that's why we have the airport here. This is something we have to forego. This is something that's not possible for everyone in the future. Should it be possible? So good stuff we like, we shall also have to lose. And thinking about that, of course, is not fun. And a last very concrete way uh, that uh, scientists describe about the loss we experience is the actual loss you see. So if you have a beloved part of nature, I don't know, you like to go in the woods in Finland, you see concrete changes in the nature that you were always used to. Or if you live in California, 
you see the weather around you changing in such a way that you no longer remember the place you grew up in or that you used to visit. So there's a lot of loss, there's denial that results from it, and there's passive acceptance by when you don't know what to do with it. But how do we, knowing that apparently there are emotions that influence what you do, how do we communicate about that? And one of the things that got me into this research uh, about discomfortable emotions and about climate change was that I found it very peculiar that there were a lot of social movements and NGOs who actually said one thing, we have to stay positive. So in every sort of communication uh, advice that they gave, there was one thing always mentioned, don't be a narrator of doom. Just give something positive and concrete that you can do. And I think that's yeah, based on a false assumption because it's sort of, on the one hand, it says that Bad emotions can never have an influence that has a good result. But some people know, like, if you're really angry, you might break up with your partner who is not nice to you. Or if you feel ashamed, you might apologize for something you did wrong. So sometimes negative emotions are just a part of life that turn you into a good direction, even though it doesn't feel good to be ashamed or to be angry. So that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, all this focus on how you communicate sort of presumes that communication is the problem. Whereas we all know what's going on. And probably your parents also know. And probably your neighbor knows. And probably the people from the city you come from. Probably everybody already knows. So is communication really the problem that prevents people from inaction or action? So? <laughs> What does actually influence action or inaction? And I think there we should look at those uh, players who make the most impact. And those are politicians and those are businesses. Because they can make the laws and they can decide to improve their behavior whether there are laws or not, or can decide to follow the law or not follow the law. And they know what's been going on. It's not that because they felt sad about climate breakdown that they decided to change something. It's because financial interest pushed them to try to greenwash part of their propaganda. So greenwashing is a term that refers to the sort of, yeah, painting a better picture of yourself by uh, deciding to do certain things, like um, organize a festival for kids where you tell them uh, that the future needs fossil fuels, but that they also invest 1% of their total uh, revenue in uh, green solutions, like CO2 capturing. So those are the kind of yeah, things they do and the things they decide to do because they knew since 1992 about climate breakdown. And I think what is a thing we often forget, and when I say we, I now think of like NGOs and activists, is that we try to reach an audience, we try to adjust our message and our, like the emotions we want to convey in some sort of way, but we forget that maybe communication is not the only problem. Maybe it's not just how you bring the message, but also the message itself, that you should change, that your business model is unstable uh, and corrupt, that those messages are not nice to hear regardless of how you bring them and regardless of how you communicate the emotions. Which brings me to another way to deal with emotions, which is not accepting the loss or denying or passive acceptance or whatever, but which is gaining agency through action. And what that actually means is a lot of people experience a sort of hopelessness. Those people who are very involved in the subject, they experience hopelessness, they have something called cognitive dissonance. 
So they realize that their actions are not coherent with what they know to be true. And they have the idea that they cannot make an impact. And what uh, two scientists, Rosemary Rendell and Paul Hoggett say is, if you organize, then you sort of gain some form of control back, even if that doesn't directly result in the end of the fossil fuel industry or a Green New Deal kind of hippie paradise. Just the fact of coming together and making a concrete change somewhere uh, already uh, counters the sort of hopelessness that people feel. So, in a sense, um, it's not only important that we act, but how we act and what ways we act. Yes, and uh, organizing and mobilizing uh, people around a common purpose and a shared vision is how we can cope with the sense of uh, hopelessness or a denial and passive acceptance. Yeah, and then there's civic actions. Let's talk about those, because I know Harriet's also involved with the fossil-free culture movement. Yes, and uh, we asked her to elaborate on an intervention, a powerful art intervention they made last year at the Concertgebouw. So Fossil Free Culture is a group of artists, activists and academics. And what we recognized is that there are several what we call pillars of power that uphold the fossil fuel industry. So of course it's laws. Uh, which is why it's good that uh, Milieu Defensi is taking Shell to court, but it's also uh, how the public receives them, uh, the, the financial power they have, so there are several pillars that sort of keep them able to do what they do, and we recognize that one of them is what they call the social license to operate. So the public sort of accepts Shell to destroy our planet because we think they're good, because we like the, the videos that they now make that show up everywhere on every timeline. Uh, for some reason, uh, Shell has a lot of social respectability and it's good to be associated with Shell uh, and people accept to be associated with Shell. And that's the pillar that we attack uh, rather than uh, attacking tank stations or <laughs> yeah. doing something like that. We say, okay, the, the social license they have we're gonna make it disappear. And one of the ways to do that is, well, as artists, we focus on the cultural sector. So we we say, a, yeah, a public institution, a cultural institution uh, should care about the planet. Uh, you, you don't have art when there's no earth. <laughs> it's yeah. a very stupid uh, uh, thing. Like uh, you have this, this statement like, earth without art is eh. <laughs> <laughs> but the other way around, art without earth is nothing. Yeah. So that's even worse. So rather than promoting art on earth, we say, <laughs> let's promote earth with art. <laughs> uh, and that's why we create artistic interventions. So we also want it to be a sort of aesthetic experience or something you could call art rather than because we could also put on our balaclavas <laughs> and uh, go black block style into the concertgebouw and say okay the concert is over but we think not only for like um yeah how do you say it like image wise <laughs> uh, uh like or or how how the police will react to that we not only that's uh, why it's a bad strategy but also because you can reach people with art and that's why we try to yeah, makes something beautiful and something that touches people and makes them think and which is not always easy to understand at the very first glance. And last September we did three of those performances. Uh, the first being we gave black champagne to the people who came to the Concertgebouw. And it was very funny to see how entitled uh, some of the Concertgebouw goers were that they just took the glasses and drank it, you know, it could be poisoned. I mean, of course we wouldn't do that. Mm. And it, I, I get that people don't expect their drinks to be poisoned, but uh, there's a group of activists <laughs> who hand out black champagne and they just drink it. They just take it uh, without questioning. Yeah. So that was the first performance to sort of say, there's nothing to celebrate mm -hmm. on a dying planet. A second performance we did, we collaborated with a poet, with Hannah von Binsbergen, 
Uh, she makes really fantastic art, uh, writes really good poetry. And she uh, wrote two lines for us that we sort of unfurled at the stage. So at the end of the uh, concert, uh, we, we walked yeah, on the stage. Uh, we had a small fight <laughs> with the security people, but eventually we could unfurl the poems. And uh, they read, uh, we made way for a world without us. And uh, it will be like none of this ever happened. Um, so that was sort of to get the audience to notice th their complicity in what is going on. And to sort of, first we were standing outside, and then we were taking the stage. And then the last performance, we, we sort of took over uh, the public by creating a storm. So we threw, uh, we, we composed dissonant music that's playable but very, very ugly. <laughs> Right. And we threw it from the balcony uh, down on the public to sort of create an unexpected weather event in an unexpected place to bring the, the effect of what accepting Shell as your sponsor is doing. You know, it is creating social license and that, that social license is holding up Shell and holding up Shell does mean that you are complicit in destruction of the earth because they are one of the most polluting companies. So... Yeah, the people in the Concertgebouw, they don't bear the consequences of them upholding Shell. Mm -hmm. they, they are not the one who get these storms. They're not the one who lose their houses. Mm -hmm. They're not the one on the other side of the world no. who die yeah. because of the complicity in what they're doing. So that's when we thought, okay, we'll bring this storm to the public <laughs> and to the board of the Concertgebouw to sort of show like, okay, this is what you're creating. And how we did that, <laughs> the last of the three uh, things. We work with performers, so we practice what we do. Uh, we, most of the time, we have an enormous long period of deciding what we do, how we'll do it, what is the best sort of paper. Uh, so we spend a lot of time crafting uh, the, the message and the, the performance and thinking about what we do. And then we try to sort of recruit the right people for the right roles. And then uh, we send them in. We buy tickets and we send them in. <laughs> it's incredible. This is an example of a very powerful civic action, which, I mean, we all know the, the marches on climate change, but this is a way of involving art as a civic action. Yeah, and, uh, and we talked uh, with Harriet indeed about why art and what, uh, what role art can play in um, making such an intervention and also how it can affect us, how it can intervene and disrupt the ways in which we feel and uh, think about something. I think it's important to approach it through art for two reasons. Uh, the, the obvious one is because part of the collective are artists and artists have a responsibility to do that just as any other person has a responsibility. So if it, if you would ask me why would you do why do taxi drivers have a responsibility I would <laughs> have the same answer, but the second part is because I think art can reach people on another level, and also art makes art can make visible things you can't see. So this is the sort of the the Jacques Rancher view of politics and art mm. as distributing the sensible, and in that sense I think. As an artist, or if you create art, you you can make, yeah, can put the focus somewhere or bring something to light that was not visible before. But it also breaks through your sort of rational brain and immediately touches you. And I think if you have the power to immediately touch people, because we can read the IPCC uh, <laughs> document again and again and again, and some people start to cry, some people give up, and some people sort of read it and then can go on with their lives but if you're touched in a in a yeah if you're touched then you can't mm -hmm. and that's what we hope to accomplish by doing it through art yeah, so art has a has an important role to fill in this because it reaches us on a different level yes but it goes i think for all art like art can affect us right what i get out of it is like the you know you can you can, if you know, okay, art has an effect on us and it can mobilize us, it can move us, then it's about who do you want to mobilize and to what effect. 
Um, do you want to mobilize those people, like, you know, those who are still unaware, let's say, or those that deny climate breakdown, or those who feel and are very angry and actually enraged, and that they, those who want to act upon it through political work? First, I see a lot of activist groups and also NGOs still focusing on raising awareness. Uh, and for me, that has two problems. One, uh, the assumption that awareness is the problem, so that people, uh, that the problem really is that people are not uh, informed enough or not aware enough of the crisis. I think that's a faulty assumption. Mm -hmm. I think people who are not aware of what's going on I mean, there, there must be some people who are truly not aware, but most people who are not aware of what's going on decided not to be aware. And that's not something you help with. Uh, that's not something you help with having blockades. <laughs> and it's not something you help with a better communicated message. It's, it's something you just have to accept. Okay, these people are not going to accept the, the, the scientific facts that we know about the state of the world. So... We, can, we have to find a way to work around it. So that's one of the reasons that it's not awareness that is holding back action. It's an, yeah, the, the, the political will is lacking to do something. And a second part is that awareness doesn't really matter that much because in five years, like if we will spend five or 10 years creating awareness, after 10 years, we will all be aware. <laughs> you know, like the, this, the more time we lose, uh, the, the more difficult it will be to ignore the problem. So I also feel like these sort of incremental changes in getting more people on board uh, don't really add up to that much. Because if you convince half of the people in 10 years, yeah, sure, but in 10 years it will be almost impossible to deny what is happening because it will be more present and more in our face. So that about awareness. So that's why for me, communicating merely about this is an emergency or this is really bad or we should do something about it is not enough. But then again, I'm also not a policymaker, so I don't have, obviously I can't do everything, so I don't have new Green Deal plans or ways to go about it. But I do want to focus on if we go about it, on what sort of way do we do it? Do we uh, make technological fixes? Do we have... Uh, green capitalist solutions or do we really rethink through how we're living together and what we prioritize and what we value and do we try to incorporate that and do we make sure everyone is on board when we craft solutions and uh, is it visible for us that like undocumented people have a different status in this debate those kinds of things I find more important to bring to the fore than that there is a crisis because yeah, that that the situation is really bad, you can't escape anymore. Yeah, so let's end on what that entails, political work. To, to explain what political work is, you need to know what politics is for me. And that's not the, the voting ones every four years or every two years or whatever kind of thing. But for me, uh, politics is concerned with how society is arranged and also what we consider as society, who is part of society. Uh, it's concerned with those questions. So rather than just uh, what happens around the table. It's who is sitting on the table, why are we even sitting at the table, who is not at the table, uh, what, what is the chair made of, is it as comfortable for you as it is for me? Uh, politics for me is about those questions. Uh, and uh, as might not be immediately, well, it probably is, uh, it relates with power. Uh, so who has power to do what, uh, who does not have that power, what is power? <laughs> Uh, those kinds of questions are for me political questions and political work for me thus means intervening in if we see politics as a table and who's sitting there and who's not sitting there intervening with the table uh, and intervening with the chairs and with the people who are there and maybe we what language we speak who's those invited. are who's invited who's not invited who's showing up anyway uh, for me political work is concerned with that so uh 
a lot to take in this episode. Yes. Uh, I found her, I find in general her work and what she does and how she thinks and writes about it quite emancipatory because, you know, we started with feelings of discomfort and anxiety, which she doesn't shy away from uh, and in fact acknowledges. But then she, you know, thinks through and wants to engage with the question of like, okay, how can we cope with it? And we can do so, I think, by, yeah, political work and by organizing and mobilizing. And the fact that, you know, there is, um, that it creates a way for us to um, move beyond this like impasse of not knowing and hopelessness and a sense of melancholia, I think, that some of our, some of us can feel precisely or so, that I can feel, let's say, uh, precisely because of the position I have. Yeah, I agree. And I think that um, for people who want to take a deeper dive into Harriet's work, um, she has a medium uh, profile, which we will link to in the show notes. Yes. Um, be sure to check that out. Yes. Do you have any other tips? Uh, I do think also you should just get involved <laughs> with other organization as she does. So, um, um, you know, as she critically pointed out to me while we were having a conversation is that, you know, this conversation was also a form of passive acceptance. And um, I think it would be, you know, not only hypocritical, but just like uh, harmful if I don't want to critically reflect upon the ways in which I'm trying to cope with it and how I try to and act upon it. Yeah, I don't want to end like join movements. <laughs> but do join a movement. Yeah. That's it for this episode. For our Dutch listeners, we have a companion episode, sort of, out right now which features a monologue by Rebecca de Witt that ties in nicely with everything we talked about in this episode. Many thanks to Harriet Bergman and of course to Rana Gavami of Studium Generale. This podcast is produced by Ondekast and our theme music is by Daan van Haarden. Thanks for listening and don't forget, join a movement.